thank you so much for joining uh, this seminar today. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Kinga Schumacher, who uh, studied um, her, for her PhD, Artificial Intelligence at the University of Potsdam. And she is a senior researcher and deputy head of the Cognitive Assistance Systems Research Group at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. So thank you very much for joining us and start whenever you're ready. Thank you for the inv invitation. And yeah, hello and welcome from my side too. Uh, I hope you can hear me. If not, just give me a sign. I'm not very loud. <laughs> sign? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, will, I will do my best. Or yeah, maybe we still need. Is it better now? Because I don't hear this one working. Okay. Uh, then I will just shout. <laughs> so. um, it was said already before, I'm a computer scientist uh, and did my PhD in AI. So basically all my life I'm in AI research and did also consultancy. Then back to research because it's just more interesting, exciting. Uh, and um, I found it also more in-depth. And my topics are mostly diversity aware AI, human machine interaction, that's uh, cognitive assistance systems, uh, the research department uh, I'm co-head of. And I was um, preparing a kind of AI landscape, uh, a matrix of AI methods and capabilities that is used, used in the German roadmap for artificial intelligence. And um, yeah, I, I I do my contribution to the regulation frameworks uh, in Europe and Germany. So the German Research Center is pretty big. So we have like uh, uh, sites in a lot of cities in Germany. Um, but you can see here, you can read it, it's uh, German, but <laughs> those are the, the research groups we have. So they are dedicated to different topics like um, so uh, sometimes like cognitive assistance systems or agents and simulated uh, reality, uh, but sometimes it's also, also specific for professions or going direction medicine uh, or um, yeah, factory product production. So I will start with just a short insight into where we are right now. I'm pretty sure you already know <laughs> uh, the most of it, uh, but uh, people who just finish studies, they often don't have this relation, but it's happening now, right now. We have this disruption through generative AI. So before we had mostly pattern recognition, predictions, recommendations, classifications. And uh, this is one example for this. Uh, it is called predictive policing. Uh, there's an AI algorithm. This uses historical and current crime data and information about weather, traffic uh, conditions, upcoming uh, events to make predictions uh, about future crimes. So it was uh, started several years ago in the US. So they were the first who tried it in, in different areas. Uh, but I know from first hand uh, from the police of Germany that it is also used already for several years uh, in uh, more than six uh, federal states um, in the Germany. And um, I mean, what they do is not tracking people like uh, specific individuals, but they are uh, able to predict uh, like times and areas where some crime most probably will happen. And then they can decide, okay, is it some kind of crime? We go there uh, in, in uh, civil uh, and uh, just um, find them doing it and uh, get them. Or if they say, okay, we will uh, have a lot of cars and we will be very uh, public there that uh, nothing happens. <clears throat> so with generative AI, we are like, far more of predicting and uh, recommending classifications. So we are able to generate content. And yeah, this picture, uh, you see there's two images, two photos uh, taken by a National Geo Geographic photographer, and one is AI generated. Can you spot which one is AI generated? Any ideas? This one? Yeah. Why? Okay. Why do you think it is the one? 
say left. <laughs> you say this side. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can see both. I mean, here I thought uh, this one is just yeah. like something is wrong with the ears. It looks like uh, the other way around, but it actually is not. <laughs> <laughs> this one was generated by AI. And there is something very specific that the systems do. If you look at this reflection, there is something in the eye and uh, there's a reflection. Um, so those are specific signs that systems doesn't get properly. So you often have uh, such artifacts in these AI generated pictures. So you really have to look careful as you see, uh, but yeah, you can find them. And yeah, another system everybody knows, OpenAI. Um, OpenAI. <laughs> everybody knows um, ChatGPT. But do you also know how does it work? Okay, are you interested in a two minutes video explaining exactly this? Yeah. I'm behind the curtain. The first thing you should understand is that how ChatGPT fundamentally works is that it tries to determine what words would most likely be expected after having learned how your input compares to words written on billions of web pages, books, and other data that it has been trained on. A humongous data set was used to form a deep learning neural network. To put it simply, this is a multi-layered weighted algorithm similar to the way we believe the human brain works. It allows ChatGPT to learn patterns and relationships in the text data. One way that it utilizes this learning is to create human-like responses by predicting what text should come next in any given sentence. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that it's like the predictive text on your phone that's just guessing what the word will be based on the letters it sees. ChatGPT attempts to create fully coherent sentences as a response to any input. And it doesn't just stop at the sentence level. It's generating sentences and even paragraphs that could follow your input. Now let's look further into the details of how it does this. Let's do a very simple example. Let's say we ask it to complete this sentence. Quantum mechanics is. The processing that happens behind the scenes goes something like this. It calculates from all the instances of this text, what word comes next and at what fraction of the time. Now, let me qualify that it doesn't look literally a text, but it looks for matches and context and meaning. The end result is that it produces a ranked list of words that might follow together with their probabilities. So its calculations might produce something like this for the next word that would follow the word is. The model would then choose the next word to complete the sentence. It's basically asking itself, given the text so far, what should the next word be? So it doesn't sound very intelligent, I would say. So it just that's why you have the supercomputing center here because calculating all these probabilities uh, it takes uh, a lot of effort. Uh, so, but yeah, all of these technologies we have nowadays they are based on generative AI based on neural networks, and they are just not precise. Uh, they cause a lot of problems, but still we can solve uh, or let's say. Uh, instead of being very domain specific, as we were before, like uh, predicting crimes, so it's only about crimes. We have now models, they are very broad in domains, know a lot, but they are just not so, not so precise. So I'm pretty sure you heard about hallucinations and uh, such stuff, uh, these models too. So what happened after uh, OpenAI announced, uh, I think it was ChatGPT 4, they also launched GPTs. So if you have the account where you have to pay for, you can set up your own G GPT. And this one was very funny because I've seen this, this was a 70 year old guy, a child who is very interested in Pokemon. And he said, okay, I would like to have a chat GPT that can train with me. I can ask it questions about Pokemons. I don't know if you're familiar with the word. I still don't understand anything that's happening there. And also can some can do some quizzes with me. So we started to write down in natural language what we want 
this uh, GPT to do. And after half an hour, we had a GPT called Pokemon that can answer your questions and uh, do these quizzes with you. So pretty simple. And yeah, they launched the GPT store. So it is basis for other developments such as the AI pin. Anybody heard about the AI pin? Uh, it is not available in Europe, unfortunately. Uh, but it is available since the beginning of this year in, in uh, the US. So this was developed by former employees of uh, Apple. And this is just a small device you can put on your clothes. It has a camera and other sensoric stuff that you used to have in your phone with accelerator and microphone and boxes and um, a bit of stuff from fitness bands. And you can talk to it. It is connected to ChatGPT. And um, I think the technology they started with was uh, exactly ChatGPT4. So you can talk to your device. You don't need your phone anymore. And it, it can answer your questions. And what they do is um, they kind of trying to replace the smartphone because this device is able to, uh, to put a screen on your hand or anything else there and it is interactive. So you can um, uh, yeah, change your volume or do whatever you want to do without taking out the phone. So this is a direction that the people say it will go into because with these technologies, we are not, uh, we don't need to, to touch and type and do all this stuff. Uh, the systems understand us so we are able to do much more um, multimodal communications. And if, if it's not the phone, it is something on your clothes. It is more, it has more the perspective you have on your environment. So it sees where you are going, what you are doing. It's not like um, I have to work like this. So. And another uh, development that is very interesting that uh, now we have robots that are um, able to learn. So they, uh, they are watching us how we do something. It works in simple things like uh, switching on the TV but they are able uh, to learn and then try themselves. So it's a um, um, lot of reinforcement learning and also the like the domain knowledge based on these models behind. So this is something that we change a lot too because robotics uh, were kind of limited without this uh, general knowledge or general domain knowledge. And also because you had to teach them more excessively what to do. But if they can learn, uh, this development will be uh, fast too. So, I mean, I don't need to tell you, AI will have a major impact on our lives. So there is the big question, but about fairness. So if we ask about fairness, we are talking about diversity, stereotypes, and bias. If you ask Deli to create a picture of a doctor, nurse, CEO, pilot, a lawyer, and a cashier, so the first results, uh, I have to say like three years ago, nowadays it's a bit better, but the first results is super stereotypical. As you can see, so those are the men and nurse and cashier are the women. But if you try it again and again, choose pictures uh, and um, go deeper into this generation process, you will find something like this. So if you look at the faces now, they are pretty gender neutral, uh, especially this person here in the middle, I couldn't say if it's supposed to be a man or a woman. So, and this example shows that Although we have a lot of examples that AI systems can produce highly discriminatory results and reinforce existing stereotypes, we see that AI system can certainly lead to results in which stereotypes are not reproduced or, or, or even mitigated or even overcome. So why is this happening? Uh, Nora Arika said, the evolution of the human mind is embodied in the evolution of technology. So it's us. 
it's simply us. This is our biases and uh, that and stereotypes they flow into the systems. So we are talking about data, algorithmic, and design bias. Are you familiar with those uh, concepts? Usually, if you uh, search for bias, you will always find data and algorithmic bias. But designer bias is uh, mostly lost. Um, but let's go quickly through them. Because if we are aware of these biases, then we can do something against them. So data bias, I mean, that's the most uh, common one or the most uh, known one um, is an error that occurs when, cer when certain elements of a data set are underweight or underrepresented. Bias data sets do not accurately represent the use case, leading to bias results, uh, systematic bias and low accuracy. Um, so when we are talking about data bias, there are a lot of bias types uh, in this. So systematic bias is uh, very well known. Uh, automation bias, um, when you accept and apply that AI-based recommendation before verifying if it's true. Uh, selection bias in data science, data engineering, when the data is not properly randomized. Um, so your results, so your sample at the end is not representative. Uh, data over and underfitting, so typical machine learning stuff. Um, <clears throat> and we have a lot of more bias types like reporting bias, overgeneralization bias, group attribution bias, implicit and implicit bias, bias types. And um, it is also good to know that it is possible to have like uh, put bias into the system without an intention. But um, it is also uh, possible to to have intended bias. So the the yeah most common uh, example for data bias is uh, the face recognition. So uh, white men ninety nine percent accuracy and uh, black women only seventy five. We know this problem already for decades actually, and uh, researchers are still working on it. It's getting better. Uh, but it's still a problem. And um, it is a um, curious example because we have so many pictures of faces and still uh, we have this problem. So in this case, we are talking about intersectional bias, it's gender and race. Another example is predictive policing. Um, so predicting crimes. What can happen here is overadaption uh, to the historical crime data, overgeneralization, group attribution bias, um, so how the data was organized. Using data, data as a weapon against minorities is the more on the intended side. Um, and yeah, I mean, law enforcement is uh, something very important where bias has a very uh, heavy weight. So algorithmic bias describes systematic and repeatable errors in computer systems that lead to unfair results, such as favoring one category uh, over another in a way that is not intended. Also here we have different bias types, um, but you can see if you go through these bias types, so when we are assembling a data set and data is collected, digitalized, it's our biases flow into this design or cultural uh, criteria, how we uh, classify and so on. Um, software de developers can assign priorities as hi or hierarchies. So already there are our biases going into the systems um, and some algorithms collect their own data based on criteria selected by humans. And uh, yeah, Algorithms may also reinforce stereotypes and preferences when they process and display relevant relevant data to human users, and we just take it. So um, uh, if you go shopping on Amazon, people in Germany do that a lot, you get uh, always this list of uh, what did other people buy who looked at this, uh, this particular something. And then you just go through because 
why should I search for myself? So if this was biased, um, of course, um, I will reinforce it. Uh, there was a headline in October 2018 uh, of Amazon uh, because they were um, seeing what every uh, uh, application that contained words like women or women's college. Of course, they never told us uh, what happened there, but if you look at bias types, uh, algorithmic bias, data bias, it could be subjective definition of target variables, uh, incorrect handling of training data, of course, inaccurate feature selection, and also masking hidden uh, discrimination. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure it was not the last one, but this is also a possibility. So, and last but not least, designer bias. So UX designer, product designer can create discriminatory results if they do not include our stakeholders uh, in the design process. So this is what we uh, say, user-centered design, participative design. And uh, furthermore, when we doing our surveys or studies and we get back the data, um, it is very disorganized and we have our confirmation bias. And so we have so many unconscious biases. So usually uh, you think, okay, this was my assumption and you will read exactly that in the data. Um, yeah, that's exactly uh, <laughs> written here also. So on biases, how we uh, prepare a system uh, last year or the year before I was at a conference, there was a PhD student um, uh, giving a presentation about his PhD topic. And he was using a smartphone to collect data for his research. And one requirement was that was the, that the smartphone was in, in the jeans pocket. So how many women have you ever seen wearing their smartphones here? We had a long discussion, but he said, yeah, it is a, so they had a small group of doctor students and they were all men. So nobody came up with the idea, okay, so maybe if we should look at some other ways of uh, data collection. Yeah, confirmation bias, we uh, already talked about it. Uh, we look for patterns that confirm on our hypothesis. Uh, framing bias is about how information is presented. I have an example for this. So uh, imagine you are evaluating a search engine and you got a result. And when you say one in five users did not find the search button, or you say 80% of users successfully completed the search task, in the second, you would say picking up lowers, next problem. But in the first case, you would say, okay, I need to adjust the application, 80% is not high. This is a very typical uh, bias because when we read, we don't exactly go behind things. <clears throat> and it is something that is also very effectful. And hindsight bias, the tendency to claim that a certain outcome was to be expected. Um, it is kind of uh, connected to confirmation bias and there's polarization bias, clustering bias, and so on. So when, um, in Germany, we say, I don't know if it's also valid in, uh, in, um, in uh, Spanish language or in, in uh, um, English, but we say it's all sinking in drawers. So you put everybody in a drawer. So this kind of person, drawer one, this kind of person, drawer two. So this is a typical clustering bias. Yeah, and the most prominent example for designer bias is the 50 percentile man. That's the crash dummy uh, for cars. It represents almost the entire population in terms of road safety. And it is modeled on the average man in North America and Central Europe. It is 175 centimeters tall, uh, weighing 78 kilograms and with average mere body measurements. So of course it's equipped with sensors to measure everything happening in the crash tests. But yeah, so our route safety is based on this man. Um, 
uh, it was created by General Motors. And later, the uh, voices got loud that, okay, we need uh, crash dummies, like more like women. And the engineers said, okay, no problem, we will just make it smaller. Until they had some some female engineers there who told them, okay, guys, <laughs> sorry, that's not working because women have complete different proportions. So um, after that, they created also crash dummies uh, that have more like the female proportions and also children. But the sad truth is, as far as I know, it is not mandatory only in Sweden and I think also only since a year or one and a half to use female crash dummies for crash tests. So that's not exactly what I would uh, say it's a safe driving for us. Okay, so we were talking about bias types and then we know the bias types we can hold back before we take decisions and uh, take time to think about, okay, where we biased uh, in these steps or also think about where could flow bias into our research and development process. But it is also possible to, to take it a step further. So for example, uh, in virtual reality, we are creating imaginary words and in these words, it could be, we could create in a way that it is bias-free. Uh, bias so people uh, immersing in these words would get this um, different mindset or different experience and maybe learn from that. Um, it also helps uh, to, to, I mean, because it's immersive, uh, the chance of get a higher level of empathy in certain contexts is uh, higher. And uh, avatars and chatbots. So there are a lot of um, articles, papers about um, harassment on chatbots because these customers support chatbots used to be female chatbots. So they are always uh, saying sorry and are very nice. And uh, there are studies that female chatbots are like more compatible <laughs> to customer support task um but yeah they are getting harassed and my question is why are they designed social culturally narrow and reproduce these stereotypes so why why we do we, do we do that we could design them differently we could design them in a way that they um they tell people okay no that's not okay or you are biased now so we can put more uh, effort in these developments. So that's one uh, project we will try to do soon. So there is a general frameworks, a framework for diversity of a, aware AI. It is oriented on the research pro process. And I mean, it is really um, general, but <clears throat> Then you start when you have your problem or your idea what you want to do. Uh, you should ask yourself, what role can diversity play in my work? Which dimensions are relevant? So it can be a lot of, I mean, there are so many dimensions. What are the relevant factors? And this is a very important questions, question. What are the assumptions? Because it is unconscious bias. So unconscious, it means you don't exactly know every second yet that you have this bias. But if you write down your assumptions, then in this case, what I was mentioning before, the person with the smartphone in the pocket, he had the assumption that people wear their smartphones there. So if you write down your assumptions or make it explicit for yourself, you can get to the core and you can detect your bias and you can start this research process kind of bias free. And then it goes through the entire process. So which stakeholders uh, do I need to involve uh, for participative design and user-centered design? How do I in involve them? Um, and yeah, data, I mean, I could write pages of uh, questions, uh, but yeah, which factors could overlap? What data do I need and how do I collect it? It's also not uh, so if you do like uh, interviews, uh, there's also there's this interpersonal uh, factor. 
So maybe you might want to know um, if gender is relevant for your research, have uh, um, interviewers, male and female, and so on. Uh, how might the relationships between the collectors and participants affect the data? You should think about it, you should try to plan. And yeah, it goes on the, through the process, conducting analysis of relevant factors. And at the end, um, so when you report or write your papers, uh, you should explain uh, all these factors um, that you were considering in your research uh, regarding diversity and also um, um, the methods you used. So not only the results. So, and yeah, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. So what can we do in the area of inclusion? Uh, one is to include special stakeholders, stakeholder groups in your research uh, process uh, to make sure that uh, you have the right choices. And um, yeah, for example, I have a colleague, uh, she's deaf, and we were setting up uh, DFKI-wide events. And I'm super happy that she was part of the, this uh, group because we wouldn't have known a lot of things because if you don't have this problem, you don't know uh, what she's dealing with. But at the end, we were able to set up a process that was like um, cross language and also for people who have difficulties to hear and also for people who have difficulties to see. That worked pretty well. And uh, another uh, direction is, uh, yeah, AI systems for inclusion. And this is one example. And physical contact is necessary. These preconditions often lead to social isolation of the deafblind and to a dependence on people relaying information around them. At the Design Research Lab in Berlin, we are developing the mobile LORM glove a communication device which translates the German LORM alphabet into digital text and vice versa. Pressure-sensitive fabric enables the deafblind user to compose text messages that are transmitted to the receiver's phone or computer. Small vibrating motors located on the back of the glove allow the wearer to perceive incoming messages via vibrotactile feedback. A Bluetooth module manages the data transmission between the glove and the smartphone of the user. When communicating with a deafblind person, touching the other's hand is no longer the only way to do so. Messages can be sent over distance to other LORM gloves or to mobile phones. Messages can also be sent from mobile phones to gloves. This enables people to talk to more than one person at the same time. The mobile LORM glove empowers deafblind people to engage with a broader spectrum of people and gain access to a broader range of information, thus enhancing their independence. Okay, any questions? 